This week, uh, yeah, this week we, we had a, we, we, we got the news about the passing of uh, Bishop Dorsonville. Um, I, 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 was, I shared this at 5.30 Mass. I shared this, I mean, at 5 p.m. Mass. I shared this at 10.30 Mass. Um, that this homily is going to be a little bit different than what you're used to, and I'm just not going to be loud and as funny, hopefully. Um, so, uh, but we got the news uh, on Friday night. Um, I, got an, I got a text message that basically said, hey, uh, all priests, check your email now. Um, and when I got the message, it said he had passed away at 650 complications with, uh, with some sickness that he was dealing with. Um, there are various different reports of what happened and everything, but that's not really important. Um, I, in, the, in the last couple of days, though, I, I think when I got that message, um, the first thing I did was is I was like, okay, what priest got this that probably doesn't check his email and probably needs to know what's going on? Uh, so I called Father Mitch immediately. <laughs> um, and he hadn't checked his email, and he didn't know what was going on. But I talked to him. I talked to a few people um, that, that I knew worked with Bishop and uh, just wanted to try and get a feel for what was going on, how they were doing, those kind of things. In the last, like, day and a half, um, or two days, that we've, there's been a lot of just talking amongst uh, with, with the group of priest friends that we have and just amongst our clergy and just there's a couple of different sentiments that I've kind of distilled down um, within, the, within the clergy that I was going to share with you. Um, the first one is uh, just a sadness, um, just of, of, of somebody passing away, um, particularly somebody um, who has been our, our shepherd now for nine months. Um, we had been waiting for years and for, for a year uh, since Bishop Bob had left for a new bishop and wondering what's going to happen and wondering who's going to be. He gets here. We get to know him. We start like building relationships with him. Um, and basically, I, as a priest, just so you could, just to share it with you a little bit, um, when we have a bishop that, that's like the shepherd, he's the leader, he's the one that is kind of guiding everything we do, and when we don't, there's a little bit of a feeling of being an orphan, right? Um, so there's just kind of a sadness, not only of like, oh, there's this man in, in, in his personality, and if you've ever met him, like when he walks into a room, he's the lightning bolt, he, he's going to pick on people, he's going to laugh with people, he's going to joke with people, he might push a little bit too far, he's going to apologize later, he's a good Cajun, basically, from Columbia, that's, that's who he was. Um, so, like, it's just, that's how, it, that, that was his personality, gregarious personality, extrovert personality. And I think there's just a sadness, um, firstly, there. Um, if you're looking at, you scroll through Facebook and you see people, well, I met him at a Mass, and you, we had this little exchange, or I met him here, and we had this, or he did this for us. People from D.C. saying the same thing. That was the first thing that's just kind of been circulating. I think the second thing is, uh, well, he's been here for nine months, and as we have one of the smallest dioceses in the United States. I think there's one diocese that's smaller, and it's Rhode Island. It's the whole state. Um, but I, if I'm not mistaken, I think we're one of the smallest dioceses in the United States, um, but even if we're one of the smallest dioceses with a small population and we're, we're relatively in a forgotten corner of the world, right, um, the nine months is not a long time. So nine months is, uh, he's, he's visited a bunch of parishes and he's done some different ministry and things like that. He's visited, I know, with Acts groups and things like that. He's been here with our college students. He came tailgate and drank a beer with me. That, this homily's not being recorded, so I don't feel like, I don't care, I'll tell you that. Um, but like, we, we had a good time and he's, he's done those things, but nine months is just not that long. So I think there's even been like some, in just some conversation I've shared with people, that there's been almost some guilt of, I feel like I should be more upset than I am, but I really didn't know the man. Nine months is just not that long, right? Um, Some people worked with him, and he made a huge impact on him, and I think most of the people that sit in the pews, though, they hear his name as opposed to Shelton, they hear Mario, and all of a sudden, that's the person, and okay, it's about how much I know of our bishop. Maybe a picture. We've got one now, right? Like, so if, there is, if you're in that spot, like, it's okay. Just be where you are. That's fine. I just wanted to name, because I think there might be almost some confusion of, I'm, I should be more sad than I am. I think the final thing, the final move, um, if I'm honest, and just to share with you, um, is quite honestly, the, the third one is really, I'm just tired. From COVID to Ida to Bishop leaving to getting a new bishop to now him dying, like at a certain point, I'm like, God, is this enough? And I'm just kind of tired. Um, I think uh, I think a lot of our priests are are whether it whether we're going to say it or not. I think there's a fatigue that a lot of us kind of carry in the last over the last five six years now, um, where we're just kind of hey, we want things to be back to freaking normal, 
can we go back to 2019, please? Right? And LSU was good then too. Like, like, right? Like, it's just like, can we can we just push the clock back a little bit? Like, we just kind of tired. Um, and I know it's not that's not unique to us. I know that's every one of us have gone through a lot over the last few years. I know in our community there's been a lot that has gone on. A lot of people, a lot of high-profile funerals have happened within the context of our in our community. And I just think there's a tired, there's a fatigue, there's a God, like, I'm, I'm full, right? Like, and I kind of feel like a little angry teenager, like, God, you stay over there, I'm going to stay over here, I'm going to give you the silent treatment for a little while, you know? Um, and it's funny, because that, that, that was my reaction of, of, in the last day or so. And, uh, and then I started preparing for Mass today, and I started looking at the readings, and I'm like, I had an idea of a homily, and that's not going to work. So I look at today's readings, and the second reading, God's like, hey, by the way, you think you're going to give me the cold shoulder, listen up. That's what we read. I tell you, brothers and sisters, the time is running out. From now on, but those having wives act like act as not having them, those weeping as not weeping, those rejoicing as not rejoicing, those buying and owning as those buying as not owning, those using the world as not using it fully. For work, for the world in its present form is passing away. Everything in our world, everything in our world is passing away. That might sound bleak. Father, that sounds great. Thank you. Big uplifting message here on Saturday night, right? Or Sunday night. See, I'm out of there. Um, like, but everything in our world is passing away. St. Paul calls it out. Everything in our world passes away. Everything in our world is subject to decay. Everything in our world is going to break down. Everything in our world is moving on. So where are we focused? I think it's a fair question. Um, because I was talking to a friend of mine yesterday, and, or Friday, after, Friday night, uh, after the messages went out and everything. And she shared with me, she said, you know, it's interesting. I was sitting in my office, and all of a sudden, I heard him walking down the hallway last Tuesday. And he was stopping in offices, and he's picking on people, and he's making his little jokes and all. And he's just kind of walking his way, making his way back to his office. And she said, I never would have thought that on Friday we'd be sitting here and I'd be crying that he's gone. And the reality is, and, and I know sometimes we can like overplay this in the church, and sometimes we can almost like, it can almost become like hallmark spirituality, right? Where it's something, but it's not really like, doesn't have teeth. But the reality is, is that every single one of us, we don't know if we'll be here next week. That's a true reality. We, we have no idea if next Sunday we'll be still on this earth and able to walk into this church and able to come to Mass. The reality is that everything in our world is passing away. The old joke was always, right, there's two guarantees in life, death and taxes. Well, I don't know about taxes, but I know death is, is a guarantee. That if a life happens, death will come. Everything in our world is passing away. That's not meant to be for us to live in fear. But I think it is meant for us to live in reality. That everything in our world is passing away, as St. Paul calls out. Because what St. Paul is saying to the Corinthians, he's saying this to a group of people that are just coming to know the faith. He's saying this to a group of people that are just receiving their conversion and just being evangelized. And they're starting to live in a certain decadent way, in a certain exciting way. And they're thinking that it's going to bring them some kind of prestige and honor in the world. And Paul is correcting them. Paul is saying, whatever you do, be with the Lord. A couple of verses say, earlier, that's what he says. He says, whatever you do, wherever you are, whatever state in life you find yourself, be with the Lord. But remember that on this earth, everything passes away. And if you're with the Lord now, whenever you get to heaven, whenever you do die, whenever life is over, what's going to happen? It's not going to be an introduction to your judge, but it's going to be a reunion with your father. That's where you're going. Some of the most beautiful moments I've had as a priest is whenever I can do a funeral for somebody that I know lived their life like they were on their way to heaven. 
some of those beautiful moments. Funerals, funerals, a lot of times, they can be heavy, they can be hard, they can be worrisome, they can be all these kind of things. But some of the most beautiful ministry I've ever done is whenever I've been able to walk through a funeral celebration and it's truly and knowing that the person that's in the box is going to meet their Savior. And they knew him before they got in the box. The reason why I say that today and the reason why I think it's so providential that today's readings are given to us is because if we are on this side of the grave, if we still have life in, our, in us, if we still have air in our lungs and we still have a life that, that has been given as a gift, then why wait and why waste time with things that are passing away? Because so often, and I, I, one of my favorite, uh, I shared this with uh, the masses, but I know for me, one of my biggest vices, bar none, ever since I was a kid, is I procrastinate. <laughs> um, if you, I don't know who you, I don't know about you, but I know me, I, I, I am like the biggest procrastinator when it came to school, when it came to things like that. Um, me and Father Bryce used to have this fight because he would work on a paper for three, four weeks out for, pay, for, for school when we were in seminary. I'd work on it 15 hours out, and what would happen, I would outscore him, and he would get angry. It was like Little Hulk. It was so much fun. Um, but I, I just remember, like, I did, a I did a paper, and it was like 15 hours. The next time, I was like, cool, I can do it in 13. And the next time, I was like, cool, I can do it in 11. And I would just, like, stay up all night, work all night, you know, 15 pages later, hand it in, good to go. And I kept pushing the envelope. At a certain point, it's going to run out. At a certain point, you can't procrastinate anymore. At a certain point, you can't push back your start date any further. You can't push back your start time any further. To belabor the point, to overplay it, I'm just letting you know, like we don't know the due date. <laughs> so we can keep saying, I'm going to do it later, but why would we wait? We got two examples. We got in our first reading in our gospel, we have examples of what this looks like. See, in our first reading, Jonah. Jonah, we, we know, we, the, the thing that most of us know about Jonah is that basically he's the Pinocchio of the Old Testament, right? He was eaten by a whale and he was thrown up somewhere, right? That's, that's what we basically know about Jonah. But Jonah, what, what Jonah was, a, uh, was a prophet that was, said, was told by God, by the Spirit of God, said, I want you to go talk to the Ninevites. Now, Scripture scholars say the reason why Jonah did not want to go is because culturally his people and the Ninevites were enemies, they hated each other. They couldn't stand each other. They didn't talk to each other. They fought. They stayed away from each other. They were separate. There was, a, there was a cultural hatred that was deep. And God said, I want you to go talk to the Ninevites. I want you to go be my message, to go bring my word to the Ninevites so that they would convert and be saved. And Jonah said, No. Jonah ran. Jonah got on a ship, and then they, on that ship, they were being cursed. So what they did, they found out Jonah's running away from God, so they threw him into the water, and then a fish ate him. And then he gets thrown up on the shore, and God's like, I told you, go do it. And he did it. And what we hear today is the success of the Word of God, that even though Jonah did not want to do his duty, even though Jonah was trying to wait and trying to put it off, that the power of God was powerful enough to work through him anyway. And Nineveh was converted. One man converts a city. Because he finally cooperated with God. In our, in our gospel, what we see is, is we see the, the call of the first disciples, right? The call, call of the first apostles. And we see Simon and his brother Andrew are by one boat, and then we see the sons of Zebedee, James and John, are at another boat. And Jesus passes by the first boat with Simon and with Andrew, and he says, you, come and follow me. And it's interesting what the gospel reads because the gospel reads that they dropped their nets and followed him. That these fishermen dropped their nets and followed him. All that language is used in those verses. You see, they saw themselves as fishermen. The dropping of their nets is not just they're dropping a tool or they're dropping something that they're fond of or they're dropping their livelihood. They're dropping their identity as fishermen. Jesus passes by them and says, you follow me. That he had this power, that he had this, this his word was, was powerful. And Jesus looks at them and says, you, I want you to follow me. And they had come to believe that he was the Messiah. They had come to believe that he was who he says he is. And because of that, when they were invited, what they did, they didn't wait. They didn't wait, they went. 
They dropped their nets and they went. Leaving behind all of their security. Leaving behind all what they thought they wanted. Leaving behind all what they, what they had come to know and to learn. Their trade. They left everything behind. Why? To follow the Lord. And then he passes by James and John with their, with their dad. And he does the same thing. And this time, he doesn't just say, come and follow me. And they don't just drop their nets. But they also leave their family. It's a massive moment. If you're a college student and you've ever moved, when you moved out for the first time, it's a massive moment. I remember when I moved out of my parents' house. I was, I was going to LSU and I was leaving one day and my sister sitting with my mom. I may have shared this with y'all and if I did, bear with me. But I was, <laughs> I was leaving. I go to leave. My dad, like, would, he would go mow the grass and put sunglasses on so nobody would see him crying when I would leave. It was really funny. So my sister is sitting there with my mom and he's talking and looks at my mom and says, oh, y'all really sad that he's leaving, huh? And my mom says, yeah. And she says, are y'all going to cry whenever I leave? And my, my sister's six years older than me. My mom looks at her and says, why don't you leave and we'll find out, right? Um, but there's something drastic about leaving family behind. There's something drastic about a new state of being that I'm not going to rely on my parents, that it's time to grow up. And that's what Jesus invites them into. He says, you, take responsibility for your own life. Don't just follow what your dad is saying. And follow me. And what do they do? They go. They didn't wait. They went. In the same way, if we know that we're not guaranteed next week, if we know that there's a possibility we don't know the due date, if you will, right? If we know those things, why do we wait and worry about the things of this world that are passing away? And spend so much time and energy worried about them. Like, why, why, do we, why do we scroll on our phone and think it's a good thing that our screen time is only nine and a half hours this week? Why, why is it that we keep putting the things off that we know we want to do? Like, man, I know, I, I know, Father, like, I, I know I want to start praying more. Good. Don't wait. Go. I know that I want to start making daily mass more of a thing. Good. Don't wait. Do it. I know that I want to go visit the chapel once a week. Good. Don't wait. Go. Because what can often happen is, as we can say, we can fool ourselves and think, no, I'll do it, I'll do it later. I'll do it next phase of life. Right? As a college student, we, no, I'll do it after I graduate. And then, no, I'm going to do it once I get married. And no, I'm going to do it once I have kids. No, I'm going to do it once my kids move out. No, I'm going to do it once I'm retired. At a certain point, we run out of time. <laughs> At a certain point, God's not inviting us to wait. He's inviting us to go. As we, as we come to Mass today, where is the Lord inviting you not to wait anymore, but to went, right? Where is God inviting you not to wait anymore, but to start? It may be dropping nets. It may be moving on and growing up from a relationship. It may be inviting the Lord in more. It may be going to confession for the first time in a long time or making Mass a, a, weekly, a weekly exercise again for the first time since COVID wrecked our life. But where is it that God it is inviting you to no longer wait but to go? And today as we come to this Mass that we not be overly focused on the things of this world that are passing away, that will fall apart and will decay. But may we be focused on our relationship with God that is lasting and powerful. No longer wait, but go.